Did you know that we have a forgotten history? 30,000 years ago, when the Ice Age began in Asia, people were naturally forced to migrate along with the cooling of the weather and they spread out in all directions. In my previous videos, I talked about the expansions to the south and west. Now in this video, I'm going to talk about the migrations to the east and to America via the northeast. There have been migrations to America at different times and in different periods. The first of these was 25 to 30,000 years before Christ, and the other was 10 to 13,000 years before Christ. So one was at the beginning of the Ice Age, and the other was after the Ice Age ended. And the people who lived in this region, which I've marked uh, in red on this map you see now, went east with the beginning of the Ice Age and in the east, first to Alaska and then spread across the entire American continent. This upper beam region is particularly interesting because it was there 45,000 years ago from today. Even the bones of the people were found living and there is the Malta region with the city of Malta. This is not Malta in the Mediterranean, of course. In the city of Malta in Asia, very ancient small figurines were found. I also mentioned it. We know they migrated to America through the Bering Strait after seeing the migration route on this map. When they migrated, it was thousands of years ago. The Bering Strait and its surroundings were covered with ice. It was like a land bridge. As you can see here, it was possible to cross even on foot. They gave that region a special name. It was called Beringie by experts. They thought of the Bering region as a country and hence gave it this name. As you can see on this map, even the white regions were completely covered with ice. They were passable even though they were covered with ice. After crossing the Bering Strait, they spread southward and on this map you see North and South America. People who came to North America first ventured south from the Bering Strait, that is, the Beringia region. The current, which I am pointing out as the purple region at the top on the second arm, is the second branch. That is, the areas reached by those who began their journey 30,000 years before AD are represented in green and blue. Indeed, there are evidences that people have gone as far as Patagonia, which is the southernmost of the migration route, and it's represented in green. We know that they even reached there 14,000 years ago. This has been genetically proven by many bones found in the area called Monte Verde. They also went to other regions. These people also went to the places you see in blue, the east, especially the places where the Mayas and Incas were. So the Mayas and Incas can be considered as Native Americans of Asian origin. They are the continuation of that culture. It's possible to prove this generally. In this map that you see, a group with the Q gene, a haplogroup, has been studied. This Q gene has gone east of the people who emerged from the area I just showed in red. They have invaded all of America, Central America, and even South America. We now know that they settled there around 90% of the time. We have now proven that in the indicator you see on the right, let's call it a scale, from the lowest 10% to the highest 90%, this Q haplogroup or gene group is present in these people. So we now know that they came out of Central Asia without hesitation and without causing any debate and that these people invaded and colonized America. Indeed, another map shows that gene samples taken in the north and south produced the same results and there were no differences. 
Geneticists have now proven that the same gene exists in the North American region and the South American region. In other words, these relationships have been demonstrated in various ways and by various methods. We find the same relationships in terms of language. This map mentions a language group called Atabascan. The Atabascan language group is a language group that is various tribes and groups living there. The common language of these tribes is the Ata president language, though Americans pronounce it as Atapascan. It's clear that the words Ata and president are at the root of this term. Western linguists, aware of an obvious Turkish relationship, quickly tried to change it, naming this group the Nadine group. Nadine is also a common group of languages found in Asia, North America and Canada. However, they all originate from the same root, being the languages of people who migrated from Asia and are close to Turkish. These are not today's Anatolian Turkish, but they have close relationships with it and are spoken in these regions. Names are given different tribes and group names such as Yukagir, Ket, Chukchi. Their societies remained in Asia, the Eskimo, Athabascan, Tlingit and other groups spread to the northern regions of America. Especially the Eskimos have spread over a wide area, as you can see on this map. There are also very close relations between the Eskimo language and Turkish. In fact, I would like to give you a few examples here. Well, these words which I have indicated in three columns are from Yukagir on the far left, Eskimo in the middle, and Turkish on the far right. There are words that are in today's Turkish, and we can clearly see the relationships between them. Let me give you a few simple examples. In Yukagir, the word AKA, in Eskimo, it's Akak, and in Turkish, Ata, meaning Father, Akak, and AKA. There are words like Ataskan, which is clearly of Turkish origin. Words like M in Turkish to mean suckling something like milk. In the old model, they said ama to mean suckling. And in the Yukagir language, amlia is the equivalent of this word. You see words like ama, ana, mother's milk, anadan, sut, enmek, all have the same roots and meanings. There are words with the same roots and meanings, like entertaining or having fun, meaning to do something or simply enjoying yourself somewhere. The Eskimo language has the word Aile, and the Yukagir language has I. This level of similarity and closeness seems indisputable to me. For example, who? This question gets asked a lot. Who is this person? Who is this person in old-fashioned Chinese and Yukagir language? One of them stayed in Asia, one of them spread to the north of America, one of them came to the west from Central Asia, so they have the same origin, the same relationship, the same words are also found there, both genetically and linguistically. These ties have emerged without discussion. For example, run in Turkish, kosmak, is a very clear everyday word. This is the old model. It's called kani, and when it goes up, it's called kon. So all three are words that start with the letter k and start with the k sound. Now, on this map, we see how wide the Eskimos have spread over a region. They have come from the coastal regions of westernmost Alaska to all the northern shores of America and even to Greenland. Greenland today isn't a part of America nor a part of Canada, it's a region of Denmark. But there are also Eskimos who settle there. If you look at them, you can see they are typical Asiatic slanted-eyed individuals. Actually, I am presenting you with two images here, one of a Native American and an Asian. On the left is an Asian shaman with an eagle on his arm. Or you could call him an eagle breeder, and on the right is an Indian with eagle feathers on his head. 
So these two people come from the same roots and continue the same traditions, namely genes plus language plus tradition and customs. Now I want to give some examples of customs here. For example, the Oghuz tribes who came from Asia to Europe and Anatolia. The Oghuz tribes are divided into two groups, the Bozoks and Yukoks. These are defined as three separate tribes or three different groups. They have names that are defined in three separate groups. For example, one is Ganhan, Aihan, and Yildizhan. They are known as the sons of Oghuz. They form the Bozoks, and the three arrows are Gokhan, Dagkan, and Deniz Khan. Now, each of them has chosen a Tengun for themselves. It means Ongun. It is a sacred symbol, and this sacred symbol was also chosen as a bird, for example. Gokhan's Ongunu is Sungul, Gunhan's is Sahin, Aihan's is Kartal, Yildiz Han's is Tafsanchil, and Gokhan's, like I said, is Sungur, Daghan's is Three Birds, and Denise Han's is Kakir. Even though we might not use these words as much, we do not use these bird names widely because many of these birds have greatly decreased. Some are even extinct. When we go to northern Canada, we see how important the bird is, especially how important the eagle is. They also carve totems out of wood. The totems are just like our Tengun. In the sense of Ongun, that is a sacred bird, a sacred creature, here are two totems that you see as an example. At the top is an eagle, and the eagle has spread its wings, well painted and decorated. You can clearly see it's an eagle from its beak. People are beneath it, indicating that the eagle is more elevated, more sacred, and can fly higher and carry a more powerful energy, even a creative force. So, an eagle is perceived not just as a bird, but as an entity that is more divine. In the Red Ages, they viewed it this way. We see this significant connection, and similarly, we also see this bird and the characteristic of the sacred bird of prey in the Turks. Of course, it's important that this totem is predatory, because they demonstrate their strong, powerful, and aggressive trait like a bird of prey this way. Now, let's take a look at the ring on the finger of the man in the golden dress. As you know, the man in a golden dress who was found in a kurgan in Kazakhstan had this ring made of gold. On the ring there is a man with feathers on his head, an identifiable sign of a group associated with the river or a water jug. We know that the leader we refer to, different leaders, shamans or chiefs of such a group, always have a headdress made out of these eagle feathers on their head. Hence, these two elements equalize these two images, indicate to us that there is a cultural connection, and beyond that, a belief connection, a common spirituality. And we understand this concept in this way. I want to show you here how much the Asian shamans and the people we call Chief Redeli have common outfits. First, there are two Asian shamans on the left, stacked vertically, and on the right, there are two Indian chiefs, stacked vertically. As you can see, there are bird feathers, likely eagle feathers, on the heads of the shamans, and similarly structured headdresses made of eagle feathers. We see Chief Redeli and these shamans who enter into trans and perform rituals with drums are still alive in Asia today. While the old culture may not remain among the Indians, they continue to perform some rituals and public performances. Indeed, here on the right, we see a red person dressed in a bird outfit with a structure like a tail made of bird feathers behind him, bird feathers on his head, and he carries in his hand what looks like a shaman mace.
This relationship shows the cultural ties of the native peoples between Asia and America. On your left is the outfit of a Tuvan shaman. This is the outfit of the Tuvan shaman. The threads hanging from his arm symbolize a wing feather on each arm, and the twine-like threads hanging on his body symbolize his tail and body feathers. Meaning, shamans made spiritual flights. They could communicate with spirits on a spiritual level and bring healing. In America, such people are referred to as medicine men or healers. So what have I been trying to explain to you? I've explained to you briefly how the indigenous people in America, who we call Indians, have a relationship with Asia, how they came from there, carry the same genes, speak the same language, and have the same customs and traditions. Thank you.